We are in a very traditional business. I, I sell trucks, I lease trucks, and I maintain trucks. This is what we do. So three pillars under Gobiao, the brands that you see below uh, are the brands that I distribute in Singapore, Vietnam, and Malaysia. So these are forklifts, these are trucks, uh, these are minivans that we distribute in Southeast Asia. Uh, the second pillar of the business is a leasing business. So we are the largest commercial vehicle leasing company in Singapore with a market share of around 65%. So all the trucks that you see on the road, as long as they are rented, we own 65% of the market. Uh, again, in Vietnam and Malaysia as well. Uh, the third pillar that we have is a financing business. So we are a non-bank financial institution. That means that we are allowed to lend money, not money lender. We, we can't lend to individuals, we can lend to companies, but we can't collect deposits. Right? So this is the core business of Gold Bell. Uh, each and every pillar that we have um, actually is transforming. So even for the not money lending business, but the non-bank financial institution business, we actually recently got a license uh, to take retail money in. So what this means is we can't take deposits, but retail investors can put money with us. We lend it on their behalf, and then we charge a certain amount of fees. So things that we lend are like factoring, property loans, receivables financing, working capital loans, and stuff like that. So this is uh, what GoBell does uh, in a nutshell. Again, um, some more information about the company. We have around a 100% penetration rate in terms of customer base in Singapore. So as long as you need an industrial equipment or commercial vehicle, we have 100% access to the customers. Uh, a bit of the milestones of the company. The company was started in 1980. Uh, it's, in 1980, when we started, we were actually one of the largest, not largest, the latest entrants to the market. So there were many larger players in Singapore doing the same business. Um, in 1990s, there was a recession, uh, if you recall. And back then, when there was a recession, uh, one of the very important stories that my dad told me was, when the recession came, all the competitors actually retrenched their staff. So the competitors retrenched their sales staff, retrenched the management team. And my dad was also very um, on the verge of actually asking many of the staff to leave. Uh, back then, my granddad, he was still alive. Uh, he told my dad not to uh, retrench the people, uh, offer them a lower salary wage. Uh, they might stay in the company. And so that was what my dad did. Uh, so after doing that, all of a sudden, uh, within a few months, the government actually came up with policies to say that every development by the government in Singapore, you have to use new equipment. You can't use old equipment. So we being the distributor, uh, one of the uh, only distributors left in the market with a full sales force and full management team actually took the entire market because none of our competitors had people left in the company. So from back then, we became the market leader. Uh, we never looked back. We are still market leader today. And you can see that companies that we had over the years, we started GoBell Leasing, uh, we acquired a company from ST, we merged the companies, we became the largest commercial vehicle leasing company in Singapore. We started other new businesses in Southeast Asia, Forklift. Uh, we started a private debt uh, lending platform and other autonomous technology companies. This is a bit boring, but this is uh, the core part of the business which I have to explain before I move on to uh, transforming the business. Uh, so every year we... Uh, dividends are paid to the family. Uh, business is still private, 100% owned by my father, and we donate to these four initiatives in, in uh, Singapore and regionally. Okay, this is the part that I'm supposed to touch a bit more on, uh, transformation of the business. And what I can say is that I haven't fully transformed the business. I'm still in the midst of transforming. And um, it's a very... Uh, humbling period for me, making many mistakes, uh, learning about investments over the last seven years and uh, changing how the whole business landscape looks for my company. So you can see many logos here. Uh, the reason I show so many logos is because these days, the more logos you show, the more sophisticated you look and the smarter you look. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope that... I think that the biggest mistake that companies can make are they become what I call an innovation theater. You know, everyone is talking about innovation and digitalization, but it's just a show, it's just a play, it's just a theater which nothing actually works. Right? Uh, I started actually innovating. So I started in the business 
um, 14 years ago. 14 years ago, I'm 38 this year. I started when I was 22. 16 years ago, so my maths is not very good, 16 years ago. When I, when I left high school, not uni, high school, when I left university, my, I was supposed to work for a bank. Uh, Kapil Singh, a professor here, was my professor in SMU. I, I, we just met each other again after many years. Um, my dad said not to join the bank. Uh, he said that he would pay me just as well as what the banks would pay. Uh, it was a uh, financial crisis back then, so I, I joined the family business. Um, and first day of work, he put me in a workshop. So I started working in a workshop for four years. He paid me a salary of less than 2000 a month. And so I asked my dad, I said, but you said that you're going to pay me what the bankers would pay, right? Five-digit figures. And he said, yeah, yeah, he would. But he didn't say by when. <laughs> right? So that's how I started in the business. Uh, my dad retired at the age of 59. He's 65 this year. Uh, 58 actually retired, so I've been running the company as CEO for the last seven years. And the reason he retired so young, uh, what he actually mentioned was that if he retired when he was 67 or 68 or 70, if I made a mistake, there would be no one to help me because he's already 70. But if he retired at the age of 57, if I make mistakes over the next 10 years, uh, he can still help me because he's still young. right? So I took over the company when I was 29. And these were the things I started under the company. What I would focus more on would be firstly the investments that I made. You can see the investments there. I started uh, traveling a lot to Israel and Russia uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, the reason I traveled to Israel was because if, if you know, when you add all the companies uh, on NASDAQ, the largest contributors to the market cap were actually Jewish companies. So I flew to the land of the Jews. I stayed there for one month, six years ago. I understood the culture and started investing ever since. If you understand the Israel, uh, if you understand the technology space, Israel is actually the country with the deepest tech technology. I would say much more advanced than the US. Um, and when I went there, uh, they were treating me very nicely because there were very little yellow skin in Israel. They were selling always to the US and to the Europe at very cheap prices. And so when they see a Chinese there, uh, they think I'm from China, so they think I'm very rich. So they treated me very well. And then I started investing a lot in Israel, bringing them to Singapore and scaling them across Southeast Asia. So that was how I started. Then I started visiting Russia as well, another fa favorite market of mine. A lot of talents in Russia, in Ukraine. Uh, I worked with a lot of Eastern Europeans. And these companies that you see there are companies I invested in or companies that I started. Um, I would just like to highlight two companies. Uh, one of the companies that you can see, it's, it's this small logo here, here called Xiaoxin. Xiaoxin. Xiaoxin actually means careful in Chinese. It means careful. Uh, the reason that I named this company careful was because uh, we were supposed to acquire another company. Many mistakes were made during the due diligence process. We decided not to acquire the company. We decided to start a company on our own. And so my management team asked me, what should we call the company? I said, be careful. Right. So the company was called Xiaoxin, but actually this company does autonomous forklifts. Okay. So autonomous forklifts have to be very careful. You can't kill people. Right? So it's a very nice name as well. Right? I call it careful machines and then it morphed to the word Xiaoxin. Um, I'm very proud of this company because we didn't start it for very long. Uh, I was in Japan recently uh, meeting the CEO of a very, very large OEM, uh, a manufacturer for forklifts, one of the largest in the world. A very senior guy in his 70s. And the OEMs also developed their own autonomous forklifts, right? Everyone's moving to autonomous, to electric these days. So I told him what I could do. I showed him a video of my... Five minutes, is it? Okay. I showed him a video of, of what my forklift could do. He said, no, 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 this is nonsense. How he, he didn't believe, or he said that his is much better. Large OEM, right, about trillion dollar company. So uh, within the next two weeks, he flew a team of engineers down uh, across the globe, not from just one country. Uh, they came to my warehouse and they asked me to display the forklift and see how it, it navigates around the warehouse and lift stuff. 
uh, I wasn't there, uh, but there was dinner. After they visited the Fort Leaves, they were shooting lots of videos and asking my guys to keep replaying the same thing over and over again. And over dinner, they actually looked at me in my eyes and they said, yours is better than ours. So that I was very proud because a uh, Singapore company working with regional people um, developed something that I, I think it's almost world class. Right? The other company I'd like to talk about was another company I started. Uh, it's called SWAT, S-W-A-T. I co-founded that company. Um, what this company does is there's an academic problem in the world called the pickup and delivery time window problem. So what the, it's an academic problem that lasted for the last century. So what, what this actually means is how can you pick up something and deliver something within the shortest time possible with the least number of assets? So imagine a country that has millions of people or a city that has thousands of people. How do you move everyone from point A to point B with the least number of assets in the shortest time possible? This is um, uh, an academic problem. Um, in this company, we have uh, 64 people, uh, nine nationalities. They come from Russia, from Ukraine, from China, from Australia, from Canada, from Japan, from Vietnam, from Malaysia, uh, and from Singapore. And we currently hold the world record for this academic problem. So actually, if you Google the pickup and delivery time window problem, the global benchmarks actually rank us globally number one. And what this actually does is I sell this system to governments of the world. I sell this system to corporates who do employee shuttle services. And what actually happens is previously, let's say, a company needs 100 buses to move its people. When they use my technology, they could move the people with 30% less vehicles. Uh, in Japan, I had a use case. They had an area that was always in traffic congestion. Uh, 47 taxis plying that area throughout the day. 47 taxis, when they used the technology, they could reduce the 47 taxis to five taxis. So a cut of 42 taxis. That didn't launch because the taxi association was very strong. Uh, but I launched it in seven other markets. So we are in Vietnam now. We are in uh, Japan. We just got our first contract in Japan. We are in Philippines. We are in Australia, uh, Singapore, uh, China. I hope to launch by quarter one and Thailand as well. So this company was invested by ComfortDelGro, uh, SMRT, uh, EDBI, uh, EDB, University of Tokyo, and many other very nice uh, brand names. So these are things that I start over the years, uh, having the core business in mobility, still running the core, but trying to reinvent the business with all these new companies. So that's all I have to share. Thank you for your patience. Let me begin by asking each one of the panelists, um, but all of them, how do you overcome um, I don't quite know how to put it, but let, let's use the very vague but quite pertinent phrase called sibling uh, rivalry, but extend it to relational rivalry, say cousins and all of that, in terms of actually being the person whose word is actually taken in a family business. Um, who wants to go first on that? Can you go? Yeah. Hi. So some background about my experience in working with uh, family businesses and dynasties and uh, the upcoming huge, potentially very large wealth transfer of several trillions of dollars amongst Asian billionaire families. So I, I've, I've had two opportunities to work for family businesses. One was when I was working in the statutory board. That is a family business. And then the other time was with um, Far East Organization, one of the largest privately held uh, real estate developers in Singapore. Um, beyond that, my own family business, which is my property agency, I think it wouldn't last beyond my generation because my children don't want to inherit my business. Neither was there any sibling rivalry because my brothers and sisters are also not interested in the business that I'm doing. So. My observations about your question about rivalry, transfer, power, both power in terms of authority as well as the control of money. Um, I would say that uh, no difference from 
how I experience them in multinationals that I've worked for. I've worked for Singapore Airlines. I've worked for HSBC. If you see the individuals without looking at their surnames, and this individual happens to be a chief marketing officer, the other individual happens to be the senior vice president for finance. And without looking at the fact that there is a family relationship, I think as, a, as an employee, that, that's how I try my best to uh, deal with them. Only complication is, just like in the military, sometimes you can have a difference in rank. So the chief financial officer is more higher ranking than the vice president of finance. But vice president of finance has the same family name as chairman and as CEO. And then the CFO is a very professional, top-notch finance and accounting person. Then when I am caught in that discussion, what do I do? Just like when the captain says something, but his authority actually overrules that of a major. Okay, so that's the point where sometimes I just have to throw the dice. Otherwise, re regardless of the surname, treat them as per what their job scope describes, what they should do, and that's how I should behave myself in family businesses. Well, it's a pretty tough question, but I think background-wise, maybe I share with all where I'm from so that at least you put some guidelines. Right? So I come from a family business. I'm the fourth generation of this business, but I'm a farmer. All right, so I'm in the horticulture space for many years, uh, from growing plants, selling plants, to what we are today, what we call hortitainment, where we bring entertainment into a horticulture farm. I run a restaurant, I do events, I have a farm stay. So if you ask about sibling rivalry, uh, I remember many years ago, someone was talking about family business. I can conclude family business with four-letter word called love. It's the love that causes a lot of problems. I love you too much, I don't want you to fall. All right, but I love you so much, I'm also strangling you. So, so what is right, what is wrong? So I think this four letter word is the hardest to decipher in a family business. Uh, if you say that uh, we hate each other's guts, I say yes and no. But at the same time, you know, we have generations of different experiences that we know very clearly that the past experiences in terms of business may be obsolete into this disruptive world. Nobody will ever remember or imagine that you can actually give your data to somebody to fetch you from point A to point B without paying a single cent. I don't think my great grandpa will know that. They say that's a scam, all right? <laughs> but today itself, we willingly give our data, so we open up an app and we can do so much of transaction in the world. In the past, everybody who is in the business go by fax, they don't believe in email. They say that's a stupid thing. All right, today, if you don't write email, you don't have a business. So what is right or wrong? So I think if you look at the time has changed, but in family, it's a bit more peculiar because we are all related by blood. And at the end of the day, what is the biggest concern of all generation is that they do not want to fail. They know what is it like, the pain to fail, or worse, when they are down because every family has to start from a certain point. So when you came up, you do not want to go back to the same place again. So what would you do? You will hold on to the ropes as tight as you can with your limited experience or whatever experience they have to prevent the second generation, third generation from doing the same thing. So because of that love four letter word, I suspect that this is the culprit of all misunderstanding. And how do we resolve that? Tough. You just have to go through it and you just have to decipher it, as, and then it takes really a big heart of everybody to really make this work. So that, that's how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. No? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to just expand it a little bit, because this idea of love takes many different manifestations, right? Or has many different manifestations. So very often in a family business, the blood relationship itself remains pivotal most of the time but people get married or they fall in love and so what you know sociology is called the final not the consequent not relations by blood but relations by marriage 
all right, comes in, and these could be wives or husbands or spouses. And very often, family conflicts begin not at the level of the three brothers themselves, but the three brothers and their respective wives. Um, anybody wants to share something or expand on that? Because some, sometimes the grandmother or grandfather is brought into play to act as the overall authority, right? Because spouses don't often, you know, sometimes there's jealousy among the spouses, like, you know, first brother's wife seems to have more power than second brother's wife. And second wife might just be heard to say that bitch, you know, all right, uh, sister-in-law of mine said this the other day, but somebody in Goodwood Park heard her or anything. So what I'm trying to say is that complications, right? I mean, so though to the world, family businesses may appear to be fairly okay given the rough and tumble of life, but behind the scenes, there could be acrimony at a level which is <laughs> quite bloody, eh? in the sense that if I could kill you, I would. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> let, let me try to take us out of this difficult conversation <laughs> because <laughs> if my first wife is involved in the business and my second wife also happens to be involved in the business, then the two spouses, both of whom are mine, are quarreling, oh, then th there's no way the business can run properly. From an outsider's point of view, when I join a family business, and then I see that the family has got not just uncles, aunties working inside, but the wives and the cousins also all working inside. As a young employee trying to move up, 20 years ago, I thought, wow, when will I ever have a chance to get a board seat? And are they all capable or are they just there to dig gold? And so... Moving on, because today's topic is about jobs, 20XX. If we are already struggling to create new jobs, and yet family um, empires are appointing all of their own cousins to be working in the top ranks, is there going to be career progression for some of the younger, very capable young people today? That's a big concern of I think on the other spectrum, being a farmer, I have a lot of problem. I can't find talents. So the people that work the hardest are the family members. Nobody wants to go all the way to the farm to work. Nobody wants to be a farmer. But today, if you're an urban farmer, you're cool. So I always like to say this in a very jokingly manner. You know, um, today, any corporates that plant trees, you're saving the world. My great-grandpa planted trees 108 years ago. Nobody say he saved the world. So everything is just coming back to one big cycle as a farmer, right? So from our perspective, we face challenges because we have no talent pool. All right, we face challenges that we want to attract the best, but no best can come to us. And worse, if I get the best, they won't stay long. They say, I got no career progression, not about going to my board. I will have a lot of board for them to go up, but there's no progression for them because they just don't see future. So... In line with today's topic itself is then how can we reinvent ourselves as a company to attract the best? Fortunately, over time, I started to realize that if you ask the youngsters today, they are asking about the value of your company and not how rich your company is. All right, Listed companies today are bugged by sustainability report today. If you don't have any sustainability report, you're out of the game. Times have changed then the time has tipped to our side whereby now because we do environmental stuff, we do CSR for clients, etc., suddenly we are so popular. So I think it's just a matter of which part of the period of the whole decades that you go past and whether that is relevant to you. So I think for my case itself, we are not so complicated as farmers. Uh, you know, a sibling is only that few of us to three of us. My uncle is not married, so it's fine. I've got no cousins in the business. Uh, but the hardest challenge is that, you know, like lately I have a pop-up store at Scott Square. All right. So it's one of the tipping points for my company, right smack at the corner of Scott Square called Mosquite. Fabulous concept where it's a concept store. We have retail, FMB, and workshop space. Same problem happens. It looks good. I can attract young talents if I show them the future. But then to let people do retail, I can't find good people. Then what happens when nobody wants to work? I work. So it's the same, right? 
It's like the family had to work extra hard, not because we want to, don't want to employ best people to work, but it's tough. So it's just a learning journey for every one of us, depending on which spectrum you're in and what kind of family background. And you know, we almost collapsed when we shifted to our current farm 20 over years ago in Kranji. Our government shifted our two venues and we almost went busted. All right. uh, it was tough to restart a farm. All right. And then to attract people to the Kranji area, it was worse. Even taxi uncles don't come, they scared they are lost, which I don't understand how they can get lost in Kranji. It's either go Woodlands or Jurong. So, <laughs> but that, that's how tough we are. We are against all odds. There's no transport to our farm. There is then, you know, we lost everything. So, so what I meant is that at different companies, each of us have different, uh, literally story to tell. But I think in line with the job scope, uh, we have to constantly innovate our business to attract the young. Uh, disruption today is across board, regardless of who you are. So for industry players like us, especially in the horticulture, green space, farming community, I think we can disrupt the economy because every one of you, regardless whether you're lawyer, bankers, you still need to eat, right? So I will tackle food. If I can tackle the food correctly itself, everybody will want to be part of the whole food chain. So that's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, I, about family, uh, sibling. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to sound chauvinistic. I I really sound chauvinistic. <laughs> no, when I when I got married, I got married um, four years ago, and I shared with my wife. I said, when we get married, she has to remember three things. This is true. I, I told her she has to remember three things. Firstly, don't ever ask about the family business. Secondly, don't ever ask about the family. And the third thing is, if you have something to ask and say, it must be good. And this was true. I told her, that's what I told her. Um, because I don't like, I wouldn't want my wife to say anything nasty about the family. Or, you know, sometimes when you're sleeping at night and then the wife talks a bit and then you get influenced. Uh, so that was what I spoke to my wife about. And I told her that if she can do this, I will really love her a lot. And I do love her a lot. So uh, that's one thing that to me is very important. Um, in the constitution of the family, uh, in-laws are not allowed to work in the family, in the constitution. And from what I observe, and even from my experience, I think a majority of disputes don't come from wealth transfer. It's not about the wealth, it's always about the ego. So always keep your ego in check. And what also I did learn is that people change over time. You can be more giving today, you can be more selfish tomorrow, and then you can be even more giving, and you can be even more selfish. Things just change over time with circumstances and environment and people you mix around with. But one thing I do realize is that that's the one thing that doesn't change is self-interest. Self-interest is the one thing that never changes. So if you understand that self-interest doesn't change and will never change, it's best to always segregate the business according to verticals where two siblings do not have interaction with each other. Because in the family tree, there will be arguments down the road. So segregation of the business, full clarity of decision-making process, I think that's the most important. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Kanan is signaling me to round off, so I'll just round up by saying that <clears throat> we don't have time, but the whole nature and question and challenge, I think, off and for and about family businesses may in fact become a little bit more complex because especially in nations that are not so huge, but even in some huge nations where a family business becomes a huge MNC, a huge conglomerate, then it poses a very different kind of a challenge and it can become politically problematic. Uh, one of my students at SNU in the early years, um, you know, left in his second year because he said, Daddy had called him back, either you come and become the boss of the family business or you carry on and graduate, but your cousin will then take over the family business. So starting from there, this guy, I mean, he comes here now, and, you know, I mean, saw him with uh, our finance minister, and I was saying, wow, this is a guy that dropped out of my university, you know, <laughs> and he's now working with my finance minister. But he was lucky. In other cases, Anything can happen. I'm, I'm told in family businesses, some family members suddenly don't seem to be around anymore. They just disappear. <laughs> so on that rather somber note about family businesses, 
and the challenges faced. I think I should hand the Are there uh, any quest questions? questions. Yeah, questions from the floor. Uh, while you guys are thinking, could I just ask a question? Would you uh, hand the business over to the next generation or would you look at professionals to run it? You know, there's a Chinese saying that business can't cross three generation and I'm the fourth. And I think it happened by chance because of the crisis that hit us 20 over years ago, way back in 1997. It created opportunities for the fourth generation to come in. So very different from the sharing earlier because uh, the dad was smart enough to say, I retire now, I'll let you take over. Our parents in the farming industry is a little bit different. They say, I let you, I work so hard to make you into a graduate. Please get out of the family business and work for someone else. So that's the whole spectrum difference from a farming community. Um, and I, I personally feel that, you know, what is critical for the whole uh, entity or family, you know, and kind of you were just sharing earlier, uh, is that I find it's, it's tough. Um, let me just guess, I just lost my thoughts a bit. Uh, just help me back again. What, what did you say again? No, I was asking about whether you hand it over to the next generation. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, let's sleep. Okay, so to me, at my generation, uh, I will not allow the next generation to come by just because they are related by blood. Uh, if my kids want to join, they have to be capable. Uh, and that's the only way for a company to corporatize and move on. Yeah, because if not, it will just go on and on. Because what we didn't share today due to time is that you know, for, for workers or for staff, for family business, we got legacy problems, which we never shared. Legacy means you have staff that works with you for 30 years, how are you going to manage them? Versus a new staff that have a strong aspiration that wants to fight for you, then suddenly you realize that you have to be fair to both. One is with you when you're down, one is for you to bring you to the next level. So how do you be fair to both of them? That is the constant struggle for us because both are just as important. How do you and, deal yeah. with it? So you have to... So we were trained, you know, all these years as family is that remember how you came in today and how the company has become what it is today. All right, so we never, in our family, we never fire anyone. So I have staff that's the oldest staff with us today is 40 years. All right, she saw me grow up, literally. All right, and the thing is that, is she able to do what the young chap is doing? No, she can't. But what is she good at is the relation that she has been with all our old clients that this new young chap can't do. So then I started to follow what Singapore government loves to do. So I classify her as pioneer generation. <laughs> <laughs> so the solution to all family business is this, right? Regard all these people as pioneer generation. Give them special pioneer packages. If a new staff complain, then you become 40 years, I give you the same privilege. None of the new staff will want to join because they will quit within two years, four years because they will just drop pop. Right? So I realized the pioneer generation solution is quite good because you just safeguard the old ones and yet the new ones can't complain because if not you join me for you sign contract 40 years, I give you the same privilege, which nobody will do that. All right, so just, just <laughs> that's cool. Okay. Arthur, do you have any thoughts? No, no. I'll I'll encourage my kids to start their own business. So, so what's gonna to happen to your business? You're you're happy to just take it out of the family structure? I think it's always better for I mean, the professionals will run the, the current business. I think my kids can create a bigger business than I can. Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be too cheeky, but given the national context at the moment, I think some of my, uh, my, my cronies are a little bit concerned that the Madeka generation package is getting a bit better than the Pioneer generation package <laughs> in Singapore. So I think if you translate that into business, I mean, there could be uh, some lessons to be learned, yeah? Uh, <laughs> any questions from any other questions or comments okay. yeah observations um, so my parents are both business owners and i think that it was very important growing up knowing what that means and that it impacts every day um and so for my sisters um it it made them decide to become their own business owners as well so i think in education today, what we are still missing, we're looking for progress in the future, talking about startups and how we need to change our environment quicker. Um, what would you 
think about that. Do you think um, when you see employees with potential, do you tell them about what it's like being an entrepreneur or having your own business? Also, the the consequences in, in daily life, you also are doing your administration on Sunday, like everything that comes with it. Um, do you think that our education is preparing us well? What, what are your ideas around this? Very interesting. I, I'll, I've got something to say about this, but I'll reserve my comments after the panelists, yeah? I'll say it. So, I'll begin with you. You know, someone was sharing what is the future of education. Personally, I feel that with the disruption today itself, any student that take on a course, they don't even know whether when they graduate, they have a job. That's a realism. Um, so what I realize the future jobs will be is really about EQ, about people-to-people -people relationship that we are missing. Remember I just shared about planting a tree 108 years ago, and today you plant trees, you are sane. Same goes to human interaction. Today's kids itself don't talk to people anymore. They WhatsApp. They will text you. They will email you. But they will never take a phone call until you have to keep telling them, guys, there's this thing called phone. It's urgent. Don't text and wait. Just call and get things done. So these are things that I find that will come back. All right? Human interactions at the end of the day is still crux of everything that we do. All right? People do not want to live in their silo space, regardless of technology. And technology will embrace that eventually. So I think that if you ask me jobs, I think nobody can predict what jobs will be. All right? I think as businesses, we'll evolve accordingly. But when we look for people, we look for people with a heart. All right? If you are in the right business itself, I will look for people that is able to believe in your vision and we know that we can give them something that they love. All right? So as you're saying that, do you want them to be entrepreneurs while we're still you know, on Sunday worrying about lots of stuff? I think you shouldn't fear people leaving you. All right? But what you should fear is nobody wants to join you. So I think with that mindset, I'm not worried about people coming and go because it's always a journey. But rather, I keep asking myself is that how do I attract talents to join me? And with today's complex, disruptive world, you have to be on track. You have to have values. You must have a social intent. You must know what you're trying to do. So slowly over the years, I convert my company to a social enterprise model where I want to bridge nature with people through experiences. And then with that, when you tell the story, younger people start to believe in you but that's what I call social license. So to answer your questions, you need to obtain your social license where people believe in what you're doing and social license is not free. You have to keep on putting money to tell people what you are, who you are, and then you have to walk the talk. And that's the toughest for everything that we do. Yeah. Thanks, <clears throat> any, any other question or anything of that sort? Okay. No, otherwise, I just want to end by saying that family businesses in many um, countries um, is becoming quite a huge uh, problem, even at the level of university education, because it's very sensitive. So if a professor, say, in SMU, where I was for many years, um, decides to talk about family acts and the vast empire of family acts in Indonesia, uh, unknown to him, the prof, let's assume he's male, somebody will write to his boss at SMU and say, Dear President Lily Kong, uh, it is told to me that your professors are saying that my company is absolutely nothing and in fact a waste of time and money compared to Y's company. Y being the man or the company that the other professor is talking about. So this is becoming very, very complex to the point where in business schools, the whole idea of whether a course on family business should actually be a mandatory course or it should just be an option uh, is becoming quite a hotly debated topic, starting with the American schools, going on to European schools, and hitting Japan in a very big way, and then coming down to our country as well. But I think in Singapore, the controls and the constraints are a little bit more complicated, yeah. <laughs>